I was going to quit. I was going to, after the end of that semester, I'm going to get my grade. I was going to quit. And one of the, the red belts who he said, there's another instructor in town who I think you'll really like. You should go check this out. What's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 660. My guest today, Mr. Brian Doucette. If you don't know me, I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we do, go to whistlekick.com. It's our online home. It's also the easiest place to check out our products. Yep, we make and sell stuff. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you're going to get 15% off anything you can find in there from a shirt or a hoodie or protective equipment or maybe a uniform or a training program a mug we have mugs lots of cool stuff now if you want to go deeper on this or any episode of the website we break that out separately whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is where you want to go for that because we bring you two episodes each week and they get their own pages and it's just it's a lot of stuff so we spread it out split it out probably a better way to say it but the goal of the show is, well, is to connect martial artists with each other, to educate you through all the things that we've got going on, and to entertain you. And, of course, this show is a big part of all three of those things. It's kind of the, the focal point of where we devote resources. And if you want to support the work that we do, support this show, you know, we could go the public broadcasting route and just beat you over the head for a couple weeks a year, but we don't do that really I'm just going to rattle off a few things you can do. You could make a purchase. You could share an episode. You could follow us on social media. You could tell a friend or training partner about us. You could grab a book on Amazon, review on Facebook or Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google or pretty much anywhere else you could imagine. Or you could support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. It's a place where we post exclusive content and you can get access to at least some of it for as little as $2 a month. Some of it is is gated. The more you are willing to give us, the more we're going to give back. Exclusive audio, exclusive video, book drafts, tons and tons and tons of good stuff going on over on Patreon. Thank you to all of the Patreon contributors. About a month ago, I had the pleasure of speaking with Brian Doucette for his podcast, Everyday Martial Artist. We became acquainted because he submitted his show for martialartspodcast.com. And I went, hey, you seem like a cool guy. Let's chat. And so we chatted a little bit and he was like, come on my show. And I was like, okay, come on my show. Okay. And so what you get to hear today is him coming on Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Great talk, as you might expect, of two people with a lot in common. And I really appreciate this guy. I, I think we're going to be friends. At least I hope so. So here we go. Hey, Brian, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you, sir. It's great to be here. It's great to have you here. We're turning the tables. <laughs> You did this to me. No, it's paid back. Was it a month? Was it a month ago? Was it that long ago? Yeah, it was probably about a month ago. Yeah, about, three, about a month maybe, ago. Maybe three weeks. Yeah. Yeah, and and you got to hear me ramble, and now I get to hear you ramble. That'll be fun. I like to ramble. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in just about any other context, like if we didn't have that time in, suggesting that I rambled and now you're going to ramble might be offensive. <laughs> But, you know, we've got that time in, so I know it's not going to offend you. That's right. <laughs> and, you know, we do some very similar things. So I'm kind of I'm kind of pumped about this. That's good. And I can tell you pretty much nothing offends me. So <laughs> <laughs> Nothing? Oh, see pretty, that? Pretty much. Uh, you know, if we didn't have this, like, family-friendly yeah. <laughs> kind of label that we try to keep on the show, I would try so hard right now. <laughs> There's, um, are, are you at all a South Park fan? I used to be. I haven't watched in a while, but I used to never miss an episode. <laughs> the I think it's the first Halloween episode. Okay. They create a machine. No, it's a. For, I think it's the first Christmas episode. They're trying to come up with a non-denominational, non-offensive Christmas, non-Christmas pageant. Yes, that's right. And so they're they build a machine to track the offensiveness of words. <laughs> Do you remember this part? I, I do actually, yes. <laughs> I love that show. I'm not going any further no, with this. No. If you in the audience, if you know what I'm talking about, you're probably laughing right now <laughs> because they're trying. They're like, let's string all these offensive words together. Um, that's what I would do if this was a different kind of show. I would appreciate the challenge. Well, that's but good. it is that 
it is not. It, it is it is a family friendly show. We try to keep it PG ish, so we're not going to go there. We're going to go just about everywhere else. Though. Anywhere I, you want to take us. I remember that. <laughs> I'll keep, it, I'll keep it PG. <laughs> oh, oh, this this may be the one episode that never airs. <laughs> oh, you got to get on a Patreon to hear this one, folks. No, I'm just kidding. Um, how'd you get started? There, there's the easy, simple, boring question we got to get out of the way. Where, what's, what's your origin story? So, yeah, your in issue martial arts or in podcasting? <laughs> Martial arts. I know we'll get to the podcast okay. part. I know, they, I know. They blend. So, I'm, yeah, yeah. Martial arts blends into everything yeah. with life, right? Oh, yeah. But let's, you know, let's let's put a pin in, in the the map of your life, and we'll start from there and we'll spider out. So I grew up in the seventies and eighties, and I, I loved watching, you know, the Saturday the Kung Fu Theater, Bruce Lee movies, the Kung Fu TV show, all that stuff, and that I, it was something I never thought I could do. Uh, I never in my life thought, you know, I saw these, these guys are amazing athletes. And, and I was the kid who, who wasn't an athlete. I got picked on a lot. And kind of the, the turning point for me, as for so many people who grew up in the 80s, was June of 1984 when I, I, I grew up a movie buff. I, you know, that's not much else to do in my hometown, a town of 7,000 people in central Minnesota. If a movie came out, all my friends were there lining up to go to it. And, and June of 1984 was uh, the premiere of The Karate Kid. And... Me and my friends went to that and, and I was just, I was so enthralled and just fell in love with that movie. But the key point to that was as we were walking out of the movie theater, a local martial arts school was standing in the lobby, handing out free 30 day passes. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And, and I took the pass and kind of looked at it and as I'm walking home, I'm like, you know, if this, if this Daniel kid can do it, <laughs> maybe, maybe I possibly can. I'm going to do these free 30 days. And yeah, that uh, I think that opening was on a Friday night, and that Monday night I went to my first Kung Sudo class with a, a master instructor, Bill Nelson. It was in a dance school above the local police department. And that was kind of my 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 beginning in martial arts. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. What was it? What was it about the film? Right, like I mean, that, that's obviously that's a perfect storm, you know, age wise, culture wise, the school handing out flyers in the lobby. Which, by the way, if anybody out there has a martial arts school and you're not capitalizing on Cobra Kai. I've said it a number of times. Yeah. Like that's, that's your shot right now. Don't ignore it. Oh, 100%. I mean, what, I said, what I, was I, it about the film? Yeah, I was, I was 10 years old. Like I said, I was kind of like, I got picked on. I was like, Daniel, I got, mm -hmm. I got bullied when I was a kid and I was, you know, wasn't super popular. I was into computers and stuff. Um, which, you know, is a whole other part of my life. Because one of my, one of the other movies, just to give you a little hint that kind of changed my life was war games. <laughs> so, mm. so I was really into computers and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of like the nerd in the eighties. Um, but yeah, I got, you know, I got picked on a lot and, and it was, it was that, that part of it, just the, you know, the self-defense and, and the, the physical fitness part of it. And, and unfortunately it was only able to do it for about a year. My, and my parents couldn't afford to keep sending me, um, I think part of it was financial. Part of it was they probably thought it was a phase, and I, something I wouldn't stick with. And and I know I brought that up to my mom, and she to this day regrets it because my mom actually joined martial arts in her forties and got her black belt. So <laughs> but that's she she regrets not letting me keep going back then. So I mean, you know, when when that but the the, the film just I mean it was just to me it's one of the perfect movies out there. It's just I, I it's one that I rewatch at least once a year, <laughs> not just because Cobra Kai came out. Every year, probably since I got it on DVD and before that VHS, I rewatched it at least once a year. It's one of the first movies, that and Star Wars were the two movies I was so looking forward to showing to my kids. I and mean, when I had kids, I'm like, you know, a bunch of other movies I've shown them too, but those two, sure, like, my sure. kids are going to love Star Wars, they're going to love Karate Kid. And they all do. You know, they've all watched them all and stuff. But, and it's it's just, it's a great movie. It's a family movie, the acting in it. I mean, Pat Morita. I mean, I tell people Pat Morita was my first sensei. I mean, he really was. You know, just just an amazing character. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, obviously Ralph Macchio and just everyone in there. You know, Billy Zapka. Just they all played the parts perfectly. Um, the the crease. I mean, the he played the the evil bad guy. You know, hard ass, mean, brutal karate instructor perfectly. And, yeah. and, and I've, you know, we might get to that a little later, but I, I had an instructor kind of like that, <laughs> that actually mm. you know, later on in life that drew me to hate martial arts to a point. Um, wow. So yeah, it just had all the elements. It's, it's just one of my 
all time favorite movies. I, I, I'll never get sick of it. <laughs> I had, I had just watched it again a few years back. And then I heard Cobra Kai was coming out on YouTube Red and I went and watched it again. <laughs> like three weeks later, I'm watching all, all three of them again before I watch this series uh, and stuff. And so we, we both watched it on YouTube Red. We were, uh, we were there before Netflix. Before it was cool. <laughs> before it was cool. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, Karate Kid's a great example of something that is greater than the sum of its parts. Mm-hmm. You know, you you spoke complimentary of the acting, uh, and outside of Pat Morita, I would not speak complimentary of the acting <laughs> or the writing or you know of of really just about any particular element of that movie. And yet, I love that movie. Yeah, and I'm speaking that as my ten year old self. So obviously, when I go back and I mean, yes, the movie holds up, but I mean, yeah, I mean, compared to you know, like some Academy Award one, you know, you know, obviously, you know, Pat Murray was nominated and stuff, but I mean, it was, yeah, he was definitely the best character in there. But yeah, I mean, compared to what I would consider an amazing movie now, acting wise, yeah, it doesn't even come close, but it's just for, for a 10 year old kid, <laughs> it had everything I needed. I think I probably saw it four or five times in the theater, which, you know, back then probably cost 50 cents a piece, probably, <laughs> I'm guessing back in the eighties, but <clears throat> yeah. And, you know, it, and I don't think it was until the, second or third movie came up where I actually realized that, you know, Ralph Macchio wasn't a teenager when he made it. <laughs> you know? No, he was like, what, 30? Yeah, I think I think he was 27 or 28 when he made Karate Kid 3, if I remember correctly. So yeah, yeah, he was in his mid-20s, 84, too, like 23, 24, 25, or whatever it was. But yeah, <laughs> so, and he still pulls it on. He, yeah, I mean, once you know it, you can tell, obviously. Yeah. But... If no one would have said anything, no one would have realized. They might not have thought he was 16, but I don't think anyone would have thought he was in his mid-20s when that movie came out. So, yeah, it's like I said, it's just one of those things that I never get sick of watching it. I could probably watch it once a week and wouldn't get sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Karate Kid gets you into, you said Tang Sudo, yep. and you plug along there for how long? About a year. About a year before okay. my parents couldn't, couldn't afford it. I think I ended up uh, scamming that free month. I think I probably went about six months before he realized I hadn't paid for lessons. Whoa! <laughs> I just kept turning it. I had a bunch of the free passes and I kept turning them in. And I don't think his assistant realized you couldn't use more than one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I kind of did that. And, you know, I was 10, you know, what do you do? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's all good. So yeah, yeah. Like I said, it was about a year. And then so that would have been about 85. And at the time, that was, you know, there wasn't anything else in my town. That was the only martial arts school in my town. And and with my parents unwilling to pay for it, I, I went to, I, I I went all in. I went, you know, I got books. I got, I started buying Black Belt Magazine, Ninja Magazine, Kung Fu Illustrator, any magazine I could find. I started buying it, went to the library, got every book I could find on martial arts, started reading biographies on martial artists. And recently, and then of course, you know, after that movie, you know, the, the boom hit with, you know, Seagal and Van Damme and all those guys. And I got even more into it. And, and it wasn't until it was 1990, I was going to turn 16. I had made the plan. The school I was training at wasn't there anymore. And at the time, there were, I don't think there was any other schools in my town. And I made the decision that I wanted to learn, still do it. And I had a job now, so I could pay for it myself. But the closest school, and I was 30 miles away. Because <laughs> you know, I, like I, I was in a pretty small town. A town of 7,000 people in the middle of nowhere, Minnesota. And I found a Shotokan school about 30 miles away. And I made the decision the day I turned 16, I was waiting my license, and I was going to start driving to lessons. And the day before I turned 16 was in a high school gym class, January 23rd, 1990, playing kickball. And someone, I was running for home base, and someone threw the ball at my feet and tripped me. And I my knee bent about 45 degrees the wrong direction and completely shattered my lateral meniscus. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I talk about it, I can feel the pain. And back then, they went in and scoped the knee to check it out. And back then, you know, the technology the way it was, they wouldn't rebuild knees on someone that young. You had to wait till you were stopped growing. So basically, they said, when you're about 19 or 20, we're going to go in and rebuild your knee. Until then, you will be able to do nothing physical. You have to go to physical therapy so you can get off crutches. You have to wear a knee brace, doing anything, but no more gym class, no martial arts, whatever. And I'm like, okay, whatever. I don't trust doctors. So I went to physical therapy and started just working out extra and getting my knee strong. And about six months to a year later, my junior year of high school, 
I just put my knee brace on and started going to Shorikan <laughs> without even talking to my doctor. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've never trusted doctors. So, <clears throat> but it, it it was rough. I mean, there were times where the knee would go out and I'd be on the ground in pain. So I'd say I couldn't do it as hardcore. I, you know, I didn't even get to advance. I think I only got to about my second belt in Shotokan just because it was, I had to miss a lot when I re injured my knee and I'd go back to physical therapy and stuff. And that went off and on for about a year to a year and a half uh, until I left my hometown for college and moved up to Moorhead, Minnesota, where no one has ever heard of, but it's across a river from Fargo, North Dakota. And when I was uh, signing up for college classes at Moorhead State University, one of the first classes I saw was, was Taekwondo. So it was actually the first college class I signed up for. I'm like, who needs biology? Who needs this? And I signed up for Taekwondo and then, you know, whatever acquired classes they had to. And and by then my knee had actually gotten into decent shape. You know, I still ha- hadn't even gone back to that doctor and even talked about getting my knee rebuilt. Um, and still to this day have not had it rebuilt. <laughs> but, uh, wow. Yeah, I know. I know. But I started uh, Taekwondo three nights a week. There's three colleges up in this area. And I found another local college that had a, a keto instructor. It wasn't an, uh, an actual class. He wasn't a black belt. I think he was second Q, I believe. But he uh, basically just taught it for fun, for his own, to keep training and keep training. But it was 10 bucks a month for five days a week, every morning at 7 a.m. So for for about uh, six to eight months, I woke up every morning at 7 a.m. I got thrown around before I went to class <laughs> and learned how to fall properly, learned how to roll properly. And it just got to the point where, it, uh, you know, my schedule and being a college kid getting up at seven in the morning was not a thing I wanted to do at the time. So I ended up stopping that, but I did stick with, with Taekwondo uh, and with that instructor for about two years. It was uh, through my sophomore, mo- most of my sophomore year of college, but he's the one I, I kind of reference and, and called John Kreese. He's the one who mm. all he cared about was competition. All he cared about was winning. Um, didn't care if a student got hurt, didn't provide safety gear. So if we didn't have it, <laughs> we'd get hurt and literally drove me to hate martial arts drove me to the point where I was going to quit completely. Um, I just, it was not fun anymore. It's not what I wanted to do. I think I was, a, I think it was a green belt um, in traditional Taekwondo. And I was going to quit. I was going to, after the end of that semester, I'm going to get my grade. I was going to quit. And one of the the red belts who to this day, I thank him. And I, I was lucky enough to actually track him down on, thank, thank God for social media. I tracked him down on Facebook after almost 30 years. I hadn't spoken to him since about 1994. 95 maybe and i track him down and decide i just want to thank you because <laughs> he he said there's another instructor in town who i think you'll really like you should go check this out mm. and he told me the name of the school and told me where it was and, and i called the school and found out when the classes were and said i just want to come watch one i'm not sure and kind of told him what was going on and stuff and he invited me to come watch and and i still remember <laughs> vividly that first class i went and i went and sat down there was six adult classes in, in or excuse me, six adult students in class that night. Three of them were sitting with their back against the wall, their legs stretched out in front of them with their, their um, pant legs rolled up and their partners were leaning over them with a bow staff rolling it on their shins. Mm. And they had this look of pain. And I'm like, what the, why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like going to call this guy back, this, uh, Jay, this red belt and say, what are you doing to me? But I mean, luckily I stayed and watch the rest of the class and, and talk to the instructor. And, and I've actually been with that instructor since 19, March of 1994 for traditional Taekwondo. So, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that was, wow. uh, and I and I got to do that myself a few months later. And, and like I said, I actually interviewed him on my podcast, my, my uh, traditional Taekwondo instructor. And one thing he said was, if I taught like I did in the 90s, I'd have no students. And he said, if I taught how my instructor did, in the 80s, I'd probably be in jail. <laughs> yeah. So it's changed a it lot. Was, it's changed a lot. And and anybody anybody who's been training for, you know, 30, 40 plus years knows what we're talking about. And then, you know, once in a while we get the, the, the older folks on who were training in the 50s or 60s and and, and they, they look at our comments about the 80s and they just, <laughs> you know, shake their head. Like, you, don't, you guys don't even know. You don't even know what inappropriate training is. Like we're like we're bragging about this suffering that we went through and that it's somehow, I mean, I guess you can make an argument for it, but I think we can make a lot of arguments against it. Oh yeah. Who had it worse, you know, <laughs> battle scars. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, but yeah, it was just, luckily he was, he just, he was what I was looking for in a martial arts instructor. He was, he was my Miyagi basically. He, mm. he completely. What does that mean? 
as, as to me, he's. I've trained in a lot of styles you know, over the years. Because I, I, and I'll get to that too. I moved to California to train in American Kempo, and I, I, I dabbled in Hapkido and Judo and some boxing and stuff. And and he's he's the best instructor I've ever had. Uh, he he he's a true martial artist. He does it for the right reasons. Uh, he doesn't do it for the money. You know he brings the you know real world lessons into class you know it's he's i've never seen an instructor that go with kids in my life he's, he's just amazing with kids and uh, all three of my kids went through him and got their junior black belts through him and you know <clears throat> just to give one example one of the things he does when it's getting close to testing time for kids he'll send home a, a sheet of paper for the parents that has two questions on it with yes or no answers it says my child's been doing well in school, yes or no, and my child's been respectful at home, yes or no. If either one of them is a no, the kid doesn't test. And he's had, you know, many times <laughs> where parents that so, so he's like some parents will lie just because you know they want their kid to get that belt. And he, and he has he tells the parents he's like you need to be honest. The kids need to learn this. And a lot of kids they they miss out that test and it's hard. <laughs> one of the first times I think my my kid cried was when he didn't get a test one time. Because <laughs> I checked no on the sheet and he was not happy about it. So <clears throat> it's just, you know, things like that. He, he, like I said, he does it for the right reasons. You know, he's he's one who doesn't do contracts. He does not believe in them. Uh, he's one of the first instructors in this in our area that actually hosted an open tournament and invited other schools and other styles instead of just the Federation. Uh, and I actually got him blacklisted from the Federation he was part of and stuff because he was inviting other schools to his tournament and you know, oh. yeah, yeah. He, How dare you? I know, I know. He doesn't get, just doesn't get involved in the political part of it. So, but the, and the sad part was, is that him and that first Taekwondo instructor I had trained with the same person. So to tell you, it's like, you know, they always, you know, no a bad student, a bad instructor. Well, even a good const- instructor can provide a, you know, and put out a bad student sometimes, unfortunately, because <laughs> they, they trained with the same person with the same thoughts and philosophies and completely polar opposite instructors and people. So. <laughs> Wow. Okay. And then the one other thing I really liked about him is he didn't. The one, the first question I asked him was, I said, "Do you force competition?" He's like, he kind of laughed. He's like, "No." He's like, he's like, if you want to do it, I'll encourage it. We'll train for it, but I would never force it because my that first instructor forced me to enter tournaments, which I had no interest in doing. I, that's not why I got involved in martial arts and stuff. And yeah, that's. He's like, I would never force a student. He's like, if you do it, that's great. I'll support you. Our students do well in tournaments, but you don't have to. So, yeah, yeah, it was. It was. It was actually kind of funny because I was taking. At the, the old instructor, I was taking it for a credit through college, so I couldn't just quit and start at this new school. So I actually trained at them both for about a month. And I had actually got my next belt at my new school and was still a, one lower belt with the other one because <laughs> I had been training the other one more. And I remember when he found out, it was I had accidentally had grabbed the bag that had my other belt in <laughs> when mm. I went to class at the college. And I think he saw that and like he, he's pretty much hated me ever since. So, <laughs> you know, I, I'm never going to understand that attitude, this idea that someone finding a better experience training in another school is, is somehow wrong. You know, if you're, you know, you mentioned the, the school that you found, it, you felt the instructor was training for the right reasons. You know, what, in in my mind, the right reasons are sharing knowledge, and it, it's rooted in a desire to help people progress as martial artists. And if you if you truly want someone to grow and progress, shouldn't that extend to their ability to find an instructor better than you or them? One hundred percent. It should. Of course, we know it doesn't always. Yeah. And, and like I said, he used to bring in other instructors from other styles. Yeah, we'd, we'd train in judo and jiu-jitsu. We'd train in boxing. We'd, you know, mm-hmm. different things like that. We'd blend it in. Whereas the, one, the other instructor, when he found that I was taking Aikido, tried to forbid me from taking Aikido, <laughs> threatened to fail me. I'm like, you can't fail me from a college class because I'm taking another martial arts school. I actually went to the dean about it. <laughs> They're like, yeah, no, you can't do that. But he, he threatened to. So, yes. Oh, yeah, that's so ridiculous. I know. I'm, that's, I, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> glad you kept going. I'm glad I did. Too. I'm glad I found that other instructor and 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 sat through the terror of the bow staff on the shins. <laughs> yeah. Now, you've mentioned your podcast, and mm-hmm. you know, obviously, as we get deeper in, we'll, we'll talk about that. 
But I, I want to go back because the the podcast is really the fusion of, to to my knowledge, two loves of your life: martial arts and radio. Mm-hmm. And we've already progressed past the point where I know you started in radio. So can you tell us how that happened? Yeah, so it was just a random thing. I mean, I was, you know, it was kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, I was 15 years old and I had a friend that had just got hired at a local radio station. They basically were hiring, you know, they call them babysitters, but it was basically a board op, someone to run the board during like sporting events and stuff like that. He's like, hey, we're looking for another one. You should apply. I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. You know, he's like, he's like you like radio? Because I, I think I was into like CB radio back then, you know, like you know, Smokey and the Bandit and the Dukes of Hazard and Convoy. He's like, you like talking on the radio? I'm like, you get to? He's like, well, no, but, <laughs> you know, it's a cool job. And at the time, it was the best paying job in town for teenagers. You know, I think back then the minimum wage was like three thirty five an hour. And this was a job to pay $4 an hour. <laughs> So wow, I know, be rich. Like, dude, I know. I, can, I remember those like, days. That will pay for my martial arts lessons. I want. So yeah, I just, I just went and applied and got it. And it was actually kind of funny because my, my sister, who was a few years older than me, um, she was starting her first year of college that September. I started in September of 1989 at the radio station. And she was just starting her freshman year of college to go for um, sports journalism and mass communication and radio. <laughs> so of course, being the, Wonderful little brother. Hey, sis, guess where I got a job? <laughs> like, <laughs> you're going to college for radio, and I just got hired at one. And I'm bragging to my, my big sister. She's like, well, whatever. <laughs> I'm sure she loved that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it was just, it, uh, you know, it was, it was a pretty easy job. And like I said, initially, they didn't let us talk in the air. But a lot of us, would, we'd sneak stuff in if we knew it was like a weekend when the boss was out of town. We'd sneak in like a weather thing or something like that and, and we'd do weather. And, and I, I had that job all through high school and, and did you know, college radio. When I got to college, I did a campus radio show. And, you know, it, it, I like the college radio thing because they let you play anything. So like my show was a combination of I'd, I'd go from like Elvis and Buddy Holly into like Run DMC and Def Leppard on the same set, you know? <laughs> nice. Just, you know, That's yeah. My, I'm on board. Yeah. My range of music and I had people listening and stuff. And I just, it was just something I kept doing and, you know, I did radio full time for about a year. Um, and almost went bankrupt because <laughs> radio doesn't pay well, but <laughs> It was about 97. I moved back from California after I moved out there for American Tempo and then came back here when I got to get married. And it was when I first had the idea of doing a martial arts talk show. I actually pitched it to my station manager, like, hey, this is this could be cool. Like, you know, at the time, I think we had like 15 martial arts schools in the area. I'm like, this would be really cool. I could, you know, talk to local instructors and whatever. And this this new thing the UFC is going on, we could talk about that and whatever it was. And no, it won't work. I'm like, okay, fine. You know. And then a few years later, I was on another station. Hey, I have this cool idea. No, it won't work. Yeah. <laughs> I think I pitched it to four or five stations and just kept getting, kept being told no. You know, and then no one thought it would work. At one of the stations that back in the boat, it was an AM talk station I worked at. It was probably about 2009 or 2010. I actually went out, talked to about, at the time now we had like 30 local martial arts schools. I went out and talked wow. to probably every one of the instructors said, Hey, I want to do this. I had five sponsors lined up. And 15 guests lined up and went to the station and said, here, here we go. This is going to be a successful show. I have all this. I have theme music and everything. No, it won't fit into our station. <laughs> like you're turning down money from sponsors because you don't think it'll fit. So yeah, I kind of put it on the back burner. Um, a few years prior to that, I had got into doing voiceover and started focusing on that instead of radio. <clears throat> and then this podcasting thing started coming, becoming big. I'm like, yeah, it looks kind of cool. I could maybe do that at some point. And so I, I had the idea in the back of my head that I wanted to do it. And then when the pandemic hit, I'm like, this is the perfect time. I'm going to do it. And I started reaching out to as many contacts. I said, I have this idea for a podcast. Would you like to be a guest? And I just started reaching out and uh, pre-recording interviews and getting, you know, bought the website. And, and I think I had 20 or 22 interviews pre-recorded uh, before I launched the show. So <laughs> Wow. Fun journey. It's way more than I had. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a kind I think, of I'm I think a we launched when we had like four, huh? I'm kind of a perfectionist like that because I used to do also produce a syndicated radio show. And mm. about what? Oh, um, that was actually an acapella radio show. And I, I oh cool. Yeah, but I ran into a trouble one time where I got sick. I was only doing like one or two at a time ahead. And I got sick for three weeks and couldn't get them a new episode on time, so they dropped. Hmm the show <laughs> that makes sense so that's when i learned my lesson and actually 
yeah, have, have another podcast. I have an acapella podcast yeah, that's completely different part of my life, but I do that. And for that one, I had that's much shorter episode than interviews. I was this was just music, and I had forty five episodes done before I launched. <laughs> so, Man. but those are like on average, you know, from nine to about fifteen minute episodes. So sure. it's you know three songs, and I just intro and outro the songs, and boom, 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 boom. So that was a lot easier to. That's why I the more My initial plan was I want to get fifty done. I'll have a year's done. I'm like yeah, these are taking much longer than I thought. So I went with yeah. twenty two, and yeah, yeah. I think I just launched episode. Uh, 32 came out last week so cool yeah so it's going going well getting some good guests and telling some good stories but it was just it was for me it was just always a way to blend the two things i, I love audio production i love you know inter- i love talking to people i've always been you know about that i love doing interviews and 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 obviously i love martial arts so it was it was a it was a smart way to blend them all and uh, I've had good feedback. I've been, you know, the, the initial thing was I was going to go and just interview like my old instructors and people that I knew and people that I trained with. And then I started looking and I, you know, I had some contacts with some well-known people. I'm like, oh, maybe they'll say yes. And I reached out to a few people I interact with on Facebook and that I've met in real life. And, and more often than not, they said yes. So I'm like, I started to, before the show got done, I kind of changed it. I was like, it's, you know, as my intro says, it's like some of the guests you've heard of and many you may not have. So it's kind of a mixture, you know, people who are diehard martial artists have probably heard of a lot more of the guests, whereas other people probably haven't, you know, some people are tuning in to listen to one specific interview and hopefully they'll tune into other ones. Um, but yeah, it's been nice. I've, you know, local instructors in different parts of the country that I've talked to and local martial I've done people that have been on movies and TV shows and, yeah, you know, people that trained with Bruce Lee back in the day. So it's yeah, it's 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 been fun. <laughs> it's, it's every time I think I'm like God, I'm running out of guests, and I'll have someone recommend like five or six more, and I'll reach out and they'll say yes. So yeah, I love it. It's it's, it's a lot of fun. It's it does take a lot of work, as you know. <laughs> I, I do. Yeah, I do. But it it is a lot of fun, and you know, once you get rolling, and for me. Actually, I, I don't want to say this yet. I want to get you to talk about it before I, I mm-hmm. smash my own opinions on, <laughs> on your episode of our show. How has your time doing your show, talking to these people, uh, impacted your training, perspective on martial arts, etc.? cetera? Hmm. That's a good question. Um... I don't know if it's necessarily impacted my training other than motivating me to do it more. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the knee injury still bothers me. So it's, it's sometimes mm-hmm. it's tough to, to get going and, and I've, I've taken breaks. I've taken sometimes a, a couple of years off. You know, was, when all my kids were going, it was much easier for me to go. And then I, as the kids got busier and got involved in other things, it was a little harder for me to go because I'm running them around to different sports activities and theater activities and different things and, and boy scouts and everything. So, you know, there's times where I'll take breaks off. And to give you an example, I, I originally tested for my black belt in November of 1996. I actually came back from California just to test the night before Thanksgiving and I didn't pass. I missed three things and then I moved back to California, went back to American Kempo. And then when I came back here and got married, I'm like, all right, I'm going to come back. I'm going to do my retest. And then life got in the way. We got married. We bought a house. We got different jobs. We had kids. Fast forward 10 years. I finally went back and hard. I went back a little bit every now and then. I'd go back for like six months. I'd go back for a year when my kids were doing it. But finally in 2006, I went back. I'm like, I'm finally doing it. I told my instructor, this is the year. And I worked my butt off for like six months. I trained about six to seven days a week, four hours a day, whenever I possibly could. And finally got my black belt, you know, after 10 years, you know, and, and then I got right into it right after that started, I, I started training right away for my second degree and same thing. Life got in the way. Kids got in the way. Other things, kids got older, kids got involved in more activities and, and it just got kind of pushed back. And the same thing, I'll go back for three months here. I'll go back for six months here. And just, <clears throat> it's, it's, it, I actually went back and almost opened my own school five years ago. My instructor has been trying to get me to open my own school since I was a red belt. He's actually offered me as a red belt, offered me one of his schools and and I had to turn it down just because of everything else. And I finally said yes about five years ago and about two weeks into getting everything figured out and location and everything, I re-injured my knee. And I I just, I took that as a sign. I told my instructor, like, I just don't think I can. (laughs) Like it's, you know, and I was on crutches for a while and and the orthopedic surgeon, you know, who, 
was kind of funny was actually a former black belt from our Taekwondo school from back in the 90s that I used to train with. So he, he was like, you've never had your knee rebuilt and you've been doing it all this time. And, and I'm like, yeah, what's the bad news? And he actually said, he goes, if you can get off crutches within a week, you do not have to have surgery. I said, I can get off crutches today. He's like, no, <laughs> you can honestly get <laughs> off crutches within a week. So I think it was off in about five days. But, he's, and, but he said, if you seriously injure it again, we have to have a very important conversation because you cannot put off the surgery forever. So yeah, it's just, it's, but doing this it has gotten me back into it. You know, it's some, some of the interviews uh, with some of the local martial artists that I actually did look in their schools, some of the in-person ones. And, and it's, you know, any, anytime I step into a dojo or a dojang or whatever, it just, it gets me motivated and stuff. And, and in my, my full-time job, uh, my instructor moved his martial arts school about two years ago and he moved it. It's about a two minute drive from my full-time job. So I'll go there on my lunch break and just take a half hour and hit the heavy bag and practice my pattern and just stretch, stretching. I used to hate stretching and now it's probably my favorite thing to do. <laughs> mm. Feels so good. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny how our priorities change yeah, yeah. as we age. I'll spend a half hour stretching sometimes and I'm like, man, I feel so good. And so, yeah, it's, it, that's a big part of it. Just putting it back in my head front and center and, and making me want to go back and do it. And, and same, interviewing people with similar stories, you know, one, one of my guests had the same thing. She had done it as a kid. And then came back to it like 20 years later as an adult because she was dealing with some depression and stuff. And, and, and she's like, I got back into it because of that. And, you know, I've had, you know, similar things. And the, re the time I got into it again recently, you know, my daughter went through some of that and it was her decision to come back. She was like, I think that will help my mental health. So she wanted to go back into that. So it was her choice to go back in and I went with her and, so yeah, it's and my, and my instructor's patient. He knows he knows about the knee, and he's not going to push me to do anything that's going to injure me. He just he loves having someone there with my knowledge and my background that can help. And and one thing I've always loved doing, like you mentioned earlier, sharing knowledge. One thing I love doing, and I've always done it ever since. Ever since my instructor gave me a key to our school in like 1995. If a student is struggling, if a student wants extra extra work before a tournament, before a test, I will offer to go in there on a morning, on a weekend. And I and my instructor's like, make sure you charge them. I've never charged them, honestly. <laughs> I've never taken a dime. I do it because first of all, it helps me as much as it helps them. But I'll go in with you know parents and their kids and help them get ready if they're having trouble breaking a board. I just I to, to me, it's my duty as a black belt to help them, and and I've always loved doing that. And it's it's why. Let me focus <clears throat> that. Why is it your duty? I'm not saying I disagree. Right. Um. I just think you know when you get to that level, I mean. For me personally, you know, I'm sure it's different at every school, but like one thing is that like at our school, when you get to lock belt, you no longer pay for lessons. And so to me, if I'm not paying him for lessons anymore, but I still get to go to class, I still get to train, I still get to learn, I should be giving something back. You know, my instructor is not the kind that will require it. He will never force someone to say, you need to come help teach class, you need to do this. But I've always felt I need to. And it's like he's giving me this i need to give something back and i've always felt that way and and i, I wish more students <laughs> would feel that way personally but yeah it's just it's something like and like i said it also it, it just it helps me and it, it helps me more than it helps them it really does i, I honestly believe that but I, I love doing it i love teaching uh, that's why i, I and deep down i always thought i'd open a martial arts school and who knows i mean you know, maybe i still could i don't know but you know, like I said, it, life keeps getting in the way and stuff. But I just, I love teaching. I love sharing the knowledge. I love when my kids were doing it. And I got to do that with them and stuff. And and all three of my kids were great instructors too. They, when they got to help teach class. So, so I think they saw how much I enjoyed doing it. Um, and I've had, you know, a lot of, you know, I, I, I think on average, when I, when I go back to class and I meet new students and I see them struggling, I'll, on average, I'll probably tell every year, 10 to 12 students, Say, here's my number, here's my email. If you want to go in and practice, I will gladly come in. Gladly. And I'll tell 10, 12 people a year. And on average, one or two of them will take me up on it. <laughs> yep. They just why do you think that is? I honestly don't know. Because it's not I'm not gonna hound them, I'm not gonna ask them, why didn't you call me? Why whatever? You know, but I'll watch them, like they'll test. I'm like, and they'll and they'll and they'll not pass. I'm like, well, hey, offer still stands. You know, I'm not gonna push it, but like offer still stands. If you want extra practice, I will gladly help you before you retest. And sometimes the, the second time around they'll do it. Sometimes not. But I, I honestly don't know why. I, it's. I think some people maybe are maybe intimidated with like a one-on-one -on -one lesson. But to me, the one-on-one -on -one lessons are the best I've ever had. I mean, there's times where over the years where 
you know, we didn't have as many students as we, as we do now at the school. And I'd show up for class on a Friday in the summer, and I was the only one there. And other people would be like, oh, crap, this is going to be hard. And I'd be like, oh, great, private lesson for 90 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I love it. Yeah, I love that. So that's the, some of my favorite stuff. Whereas like this past June, we had a Friday in June where we had 36 or 37 adult students in a class on a Friday night in, in the Whoa. summer. I know, <laughs> which is that's actually insane. the biggest one I've ever seen personally. I think the biggest kids class I've ever seen is about 34, 35, and the adult one was like 37. But that's not average, obviously. And usually in the summer, that's, you know, usually in the summer, you'll see maybe five to seven on a Friday night in the summer. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Friday, Friday night's tough anyway. Yeah, I think we had 15, 20 black belts and like, you know, 15 or so colored belts. It was, it was crazy, but it was fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I loved, loved doing it. And yeah, it's just something that hopefully will be a part of. I obviously I realize I won't be able to do traditional Taekwondo forever. Um, and that's one thing I, you know, people, you know, Taekwondo, oh, like the Olympics, yeah, not quite. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, there's so many different types of Taekwondo. There's so many different styles and it's, it's, you know, heck there's probably, I don't even know how many, but it's, it's, yes, we do the sport part of it, but even like the sport stuff we do compared to what the, the, Olymp the Olympics, I don't think I've ever seen a punch thrown in Olympic Taekwondo in my life. No, no, because it's incredibly, my understanding is it's very hard to score. Yeah. You is. can't punch the head, so. Yeah, and ours, you know, it's a hard to score, but the ones who do it, you, I mean, you can usually tell because it'll knock them down. You know, it'll be a solid punch. You know, I think I can count on one hand the number of times I've seen a punch score, but you don't have to throw a punch just to score. You can use it to set up other stuff. <laughs> I mean, they literally just have their hands hanging down and they're throwing kicks nonstop. You know, or we, you know, like that's one thing our, you know, my instructor and his instructor have always stressed. You know, it's, it's, you know, take one of those 50 50. 50% kicks, 50% punches. That's not just, you know, most people, oh, take one of those 90% kicks. No, not the style we teach. That's why they, online forums and people start ripping on take one down. It's like, well, you've never seen real traditional take one down. You don't know what you're talking about. It's, it's not the Olympic stuff. It's the, this is the stuff that the you know the Korean Tiger Rocks used in the war, the special forces and stuff. It's you know the, the stuff they use with their military. It's it's effective and it works. Mm. Let's let's talk about that for a second mm -hmm. because you you know you like me have the opportunity to talk to a variety of martial artists about mm -hmm. a variety of subjects, and we all know that casting aspersions uh, you know is that, is that the phrase i'm looking for mm -hmm. people like to poke at other at other arts and be very reductionist and find a thing that they don't like about it and thus dismiss all of it yep you know so the example you gave with uh wt wt formerly wtf mm -hmm. olympic style whatever you want to call it taekwondo oh well look at what they do in the olympics yep. so that must mean that absolutely everything that they do is completely irrelevant yeah why do we do that i don't know i really don't i, I wish i did but i i i, I think the only thing i can think of is that because of my, on the olympics and because it's on tv that's what people see you know uh, yeah unless they're going and looking for it on youtube or something like that you know they're the only time only thing they've ever seen is what they've seen on tv most people don't take the time to go in and look at a school especially if they already have a preconceived notion about it right for me i i still make it a point if a new martial arts school opens in my town i go in i introduce myself i welcome them i, I talk to them even before i did the podcast i would always do that and like, you know, hey, just, you know, if you ever want to cross train, if you ever want to come in and like, you come to our class some night, we'll come to yours, whatever, and <clears throat> make that offer. And most people are really cool and open about it. And, you know, we used to do a couple of years. It's been a while since we've done this, but me and another gentleman, uh, he did it one year without me. And then he met me and I helped him for like two or three years in a row. But we used to do this open martial arts seminar. It originally was planned as a one day thing. And when I got involved, we kind of grew it to a two day event for like two years in a row. But we basically invite as many styles as we could. We reach out to different instructors from around the Midwest and we had two full days. We had, we got the one year, our biggest year. We had, we had Taekwondo. We had a uh, Shotokan. We had Aikido. We had Hapkido. We had Jiu Jitsu. We had Judo. Um, we had Shaolin Kempo. Um, American camp, we had I, like 15 different styles, MMA, kickboxing, regular boxing, and that's all they got. 
they each got anywhere from one to two hours as much time as they wanted. And they basically teach whoever was coming. I think it was like 10 or 15 bucks to come for the whole weekend. And you could go to as many of the seminars as you wanted. And, and yeah, it was awesome. And the guy who was doing it with me just decided he wanted to go in a different direction and didn't want my help anymore. And, and I don't mm. think, I don't think it happens anymore, but, <laughs> well, that's a but it was so much fun just going in and sharing that knowledge and, and seeing the different styles and stuff. And, all the instructors were very open and welcoming to people and realizing, you know, we may not get any students out of this, but they get to at least see what our art's about. And we had a, a Japanese Aedo demonstration, which was beautiful. You know, it, it, you know, some great swordsmanship and stuff. I think we did some Kundo, or not Kundo, we did, um, um, oh, what's it called? Bogu. Yeah, which was kind of, oh, yeah. yeah, that was kind of cool. And we did that. And we actually used to do... My instructor does a big open tournament every year. Now it's Taekwondo and grappling, but the first few years he had it, it was actually Taekwondo and Bogu, which was kind of cool. <laughs> seeing nice. that and seeing actually Bogu competition, which is kind of cool. Um, but yeah, it's just, to me, it's just, it's lack of knowledge. People, you know, they make up their mind and nothing's going to change it, which unfortunately, anyone who's on social media and those people that are like that about, <laughs> about any topic you can think of, you make up your mind and that's it. But it's with, with martial arts, I mean, one, you know, as you remember from my show, one of the questions I ask is, you know, tips you give someone looking for a school. It's like almost everyone I ask that to go to as many schools as you can, talk to different instructors, watch different classes, talk to different students. You know, don't just go by what other people say. Make your own decision, but, but visit as many as you can. Anyone who asks me that, and I probably get asked that question once a week from people that I work with or people that I know or friends of friends, like, what should I look for? And I'll usually give them a list of about 15 schools. I said, go watch a class at each one of these schools. <clears throat> Take a free class at each one of these schools. Talk to these instructors. And obviously, I always, I'm a little biased and stuff, and I, there's certain ones I'll maybe put above the other, but... It kind of depends on what they're looking for and stuff. But yeah, it's just the take one thing's probably the, the, and unfortunately there are some there's bad schools out there that give styles. But to me, there's no, there's no such thing as a bad style. There's not. It's, you know, there may be some bad systems. There may be some bad instructors and bad students and stuff. But I mean, you know, I take that back. There's, I'm trying to remember. There's one style. It used to be taught when I was taking Taekwondo in college. There was another style on campus at the time. We had two styles. And this style actually got kicked off campus because of what they were doing. If I remember correctly, it was it was called Joku Kai. I don't know if you know much about that. I had never heard of it. At never the time. heard of it. Tell me more. But one of the, my friend took it. And one of the things he had to do, I think it was for his green belt test. He had to sit in like a horse riding stance and like doing these like secret breathing techniques and get kicked in the groin 10 times <laughs> and with, with, like without changing facial expressions, like with these special breathings or whatever it's supposed oh. to like teach them. And I'm like, and then he did, he, but he went through this and did it and then got his green belt. Then he quit a week later. I'm like, you quit afterwards? <laughs> like, I would have quit before if I was going to quit. Yeah, but yeah. the school found what they were doing, so I'm like, maybe that's the style I wouldn't recommend to someone. <laughs> but, but, the, but the question is, is that the is that a mandatory implementation? Yeah, who knows? That's in that style, you know, I, I I've never heard of it, so I can't say. But I like the way that you said it. You know, yeah, there are bad instructors. Mm -hmm. I agree. There really aren't any bad styles. Just like there isn't bad food. There's food that can be prepared poorly. There's food that you can eat too much of or too little of, or, you know, the, the classic, you had a glass of orange juice and forgot and went and brushed your teeth, <laughs> right? Brushing your teeth is good. Orange juice is pretty tasty, but the two that. of them together is, you know, it's not a good idea. I just got the shiver in these. I hate that. <laughs> yeah. Nobody, nobody likes if that. Everyone knows and what yet, that tastes like. <laughs> right. And, and so I, I kind of look at, martial arts in that way you know I, i've i've known terrible terrible instructors mm -hmm. from just about every martial art that i that i've experienced and i've known wonderful instructors you know it's it's about the person people are different people yep. range there's far more range in in the quality of human beings than there are the quality of martial arts technique agreed yep 100 100 agree with that so yeah it's and like me personally, I, I think it's something, I think everyone should try some type of martial arts at some point in their life. Uh, and I honestly think that if everyone did that and tried with the right instructor, they'd probably stick with it. But unfortunately, 
some people, like I said, some people have like my hometown right now, there's one martial arts school in my hometown where I used to live. There's one martial arts school. That's it. Whereas up here where I am now, like I said, there's a 30 to 35 within a 20 mile radius. That's crazy. Half of those are probably the best way. half of those are probably take one down. <laughs> to, be, to be honest, <laughs> I'm not kidding. There isn't, but I mean, like I said we have we have Shotokan, we have MMA, we have boxing, we have kickboxing, we have uh, Okinawan karate, we have Aikido, we have Hapkido, so we have judo. So it's it's a very well mixture and stuff. But um, yeah, and and there's probably some towns that have nothing, you know. And <laughs> unfortunately, a lot of people don't have that option, but. I, it, 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 it's an important thing and I, I wish more people would do it. I think a lot of people are afraid to join as adults because obviously it's, it used to be funny. If you think back and talk to instructors from like the 50s, 60s, 70s, they never taught kids. It was only adults. And then there was a boom, I think because of movies like Karate Kid, Ninja Turtles, Mortal Kombat, where suddenly there's more kids than anything. And I think a lot of adults are maybe intimidated and don't want to join as an adult because mo most adult classes are a lot smaller than kids classes in, in any karate school you go to. I, I, I would think. <laughs> yeah, it, it rarely we bump into a guest on the show who mentions that their adult program is stronger than their youth program. Right. But really, I think I think we as an industry bear the blame on that because of our collective messaging. You know, we speak to these personality traits that um, we we do so in a paternal uh, um, a parental way. You know learn self-discipline and respect and um, do better at your homework and all these things. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear from the messaging where we're talking about children when really the messaging should be, hey, adults, we know you're intimidated to do this, but it actually would be really good for you. So you should do it. And then as they get in there, then we can teach them about the benefits for their children. Right. No, that's a great point. No, uh, yeah, that's, I know one, one cool thing my instructor does is, you know, a lot of schools do like bring a friend to class day, bring a friend to class. Yeah. He actually will do it in the kids' classes. I think once a year he does bring, bring your parent to class day. Oh, I love it. Yeah. How does that go? It, it's, it's kind of cool. It's the, the parents a lot of times are very, talk about intimidated. <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're used to being in charge and stuff at home and stuff in here. The kids know more than that. So it's like the kids, and he usually has the kid teach the parents some of the stuff. So it's it's kind of mm. kind of re reversing that role a little bit, and and uh, yeah, I, I'd say on average maybe after that, mm -hmm. uh, if if maybe ten parents show up for class, three or four might actually sign up for classes, and one or two might stick with it. But you know, those one or two that do usually, you know, <laughs> usually stick with it yeah. in the long haul. So it's it's and there's also some where they'll they'll join at the same time. I'm like hey, if my kid's going to do it, I'm going to do it. You know, and things like that. And, you know, and obviously the, the parents and kids in the same class, that's not a normal thing. You know, I see kids, that they are, as you know, they're taught differently. You, you teach kids differently than you teach adults and stuff. But it's it's just one way to get them in the door, obviously. So <laughs> let's talk a little bit more about your show. Yeah. So you, you've given us some ideas about what you do and how long you've been doing it. Where can they find your show? So it, it should be on all the podcast apps for the most part, and most of the popular ones. It's a, it's a, the show is called Everyday Martial Artist. Um, they can go directly to the website everydaymartialartist.com. and then once they get there, click on all episodes. I think the first, the most recent four episodes are on the home page, but if you click on all episodes, you can scroll down and get to to all of them. And like I said, just uh, just it's every Thursday. Um, I know I've been having issues with, for some reason, Apple and Google have been taking a long time to release the episodes. Like other other apps will release them within a couple hours of me dropping the episode, where Apple and Google has taken 12 to 15 hours for those episodes to come out. So I would highly recommend mm -hmm. if you have another app, try that one first <laughs> or go directly to the website to listen. But it's it's every Thursday uh, and uh, it's episode 32 came out last week. Technically, there's 33 episodes. The first episode, most people, if you know much about podcasting, it, it when you first launch the show, it takes a little while to get the episodes to all the apps. So I did like yep. intro episode, basically a meet the host. And I had a friend of mine who was also in radio, but also a martial artist. He interviewed me on the first episode. And that oh, one cool. I kind of put out there and let that sit out there for two or three weeks just to get on all the apps. And then I started releasing my interviews. So nice. So yeah, there's 33 episodes, but episode 32 is the most recent one. 
And then um, this coming, well, I, I guess I don't know when this will air, but by the time this airs, my next one should be out. And that's actually a, a fun one. It's Michael Matsuda, who's the um, president and founder of the Martial Arts History Museum in Los Angeles. So, Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah. yeah, I love what they're doing. Yeah, there. that was, uh, and he also does like Dragon Fest and most things and everything. But, that was, but I, yeah, nice. I've had, like I said, it's, it's quite a range. I've had people who fought in the UFC. I had uh, Fred Adesh who fought in the UFC number two. Um, mm-hmm. But if people are big UFC fans, um, I had... Um, Anne Maria DeMars, who a lot of people may know, may not know, Ronda Rousey's mom, who in her own right, five-time national judo champ, CEO of multiple yeah. companies, just an amazing woman. Uh, that was that was a really good interview, a lot of fun. Uh, James DeMille, uh, I know we, we talked about a little bit, who was one of Bruce Lee's original students in Seattle mm-hmm. and unfortunately passed away this year. Um, mm-hmm. As far as I know, I was his last interview. Um, so definitely recommend going out and listening to that one. Um, but I mentioned, um, you know, my acapella podcast and my acapella radio show and stuff. And one person I had in there, I, I put out, I have another whole online profile because in, in radio, I used a different name. Um, for this podcast, I decided to use my real name because that's how I'm known to most martial artists. But in radio, I actually use the name Brian Michaels. So in the pot, in the acapella world, I'm known as Brian Michaels. So on my acapella world, I put out there, hey, any of my friends out here martial artists and any kids of the 80s or 90s that remember the show, Where in the World is Carmen San Diego? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what time it is? Do it, Rockapella. So the base from Rockapella, Barry Carl, who's a good friend of mine, I found out had studied martial arts most of his life. And so he was actually one of my one of my first guests. That was a great conversation, and just oh, that's a, a different part of his life that most people don't know about. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, oh, I, I love it. Yeah, and Herb Perez, Olympic gold medalist, um, you know, people like that, and, and uh, you know, some people who are motivational speakers. I have some improv comedians, and so it's it's, it's a, like I said, it's a very nice mixture. Some Hollywood stunt people. Uh, Adrian Paul was a recent guest. I know he's also been on your show and stuff. And mm-hmm. so yeah, it's 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 really fun. I, I enjoy it. Um, I go back and listen to my first four or five episodes and, and I, I, I wish I could have redone well, them. Don't, don't do that. I know. I know. That's a bad idea. I know. Like That's I, a bad idea. <laughs> I interviewed them, you know, a year ago before the show, you know, six, eight months before the show launched before I really had a handle on how I was going to do it. I mean, they're still good. They're good interviews, but I definitely am, I had a better handle on how I was going to think and how things were going to flow and how things were going to sound. So it, it definitely got better after those first few episodes, but they're still fun to listen to. So. <laughs> But I, I, I just enjoy it. It's a, it's a lot of fun. And so far, all the guests have really enjoyed it. And, and I think they're having fun with it. And there's some more good ones coming up. And yeah, I think your episode, um, I'm not sure when this one will air on your show, but I think your your episode should be up in about uh, about a month from when we're talking about. It'll be right about the same time. Okay. Oh, how funny oh, is that? Cool. Yeah, I think yours is four or five more episodes. Four, I think there's four people ahead of you. So it'll be about five weeks from now when your episode okay. will drop. So. if i'm doing my math right this is going to come out the monday after because you said thursday so yeah yours will be out the monday after after mine oh how fun is that we didn't even plan this (laughs) that'd be good beautiful synergy hopefully not i I still have to take the time to fully edit those so i got about two more edited then i have to i got about six more i have to edit so but i love it i understand (laughs) and that's the thing i I do everything myself that's the the, the one thing is i do i do and I, as you know, with my background with radio and audio production, I'm kind of a perfectionist. So, I mean, I, on a one hour interview, I'll spend three to five hours polishing Oof. up that episode and making it sound, I know, I know, I know. And I know I don't have to spend that much time on it, but I've also had so many compliments on the audio quality of my podcast. So, you know, now that I've had that many compliments on it, I don't want to <laughs> stop doing that. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. So no, I, I love what you're doing. You're doing, you're doing great, great stuff. I've said it from day one. I don't care what show you listen to, as long as it's the show you like the most. I don't care if it's our show. If it's if somebody, you know, listens to this episode and they're like, oh, I'm going to check out Brian's show. And you listen and you say, you know what? Sorry, Jeremy, I like Brian's show better. Do it. Because if you find a show that you like better, as far as I'm concerned, it's more likely to keep you training. And that's the goal. Right. The goal, the, the show, this show is not the be all end all. The goal is not that you listen. It's not about numbers. It's about the wider martial arts community. Right. And that's why we do things like, you know, um, we were initially introduced because of martial arts podcast.com. Yep. And that's why we put the resources we do into that site, because I want people to have the support, the lifestyle elements that they can derive that support and, and further 
their joy in martial arts. And I think, you know, most, for the most part, most podcast listeners listen to more than one podcast anyway. They do. <laughs> they do. I mean, I, I probably have about, I, I subscribe to about 60. I don't listen to every, every episode of every one of those. I, you know, I'll pick and choose. But there's probably about 10 that I listen to every episode. You know, and I, I, I've actually, you have a lot more episodes than me. And I, I, I've gone back. That's why I said I've only listened to a few so far because I've gone back and started listening from the beginning. I'm trying. Oh, don't do that. Whether I'll get through all 600 plus, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I love doing that when I'm driving in the car. I used to be a talk radio guy because I worked in radio. And I honestly don't know the last time I had AM, FM on in my car. Pretty much when I'm driving now, I listen to podcasts, either podcast or music, depending. Same. I'll alternate between. Because if my wife's in the car, sometimes she doesn't like listening to podcasts. <laughs> then I'll, I'll flip on like Spotify or something like that or whatever. But yeah, I mean, there's so many good podcasts out there. and and, and uh, it's it's an important medium. It really is. It's come a long way since 2006. That's for sure, <laughs> compared to what it used to be. But yeah, I mean, it, it's it, the show's slowly growing. I mean, obviously, I gotta gotta figure out that Google and Apple issue for one thing because I know that's annoying. Uh, uh, try thing. releasing, you know, try try bumping it it up, you know, an hour or two earlier. Really? There, yeah. There may be, you know, there are so many podcasts now that it is possible that they are prioritizing things, you know, cause there's gotta be some way of, of handling, you know, stuff as it comes in. Yeah. So if you're releasing at the same time as everyone else, that could be it. Oh, okay. And it's easy enough to try. Yeah. Cause right now I'm doing just after mid, like 12 or five midnight every. Oh yeah. I wouldn't think that's the problem then, but you yeah. know, maybe try making it a couple hours later. Yeah. I just, just kick it around a little bit. I gotta try something because um, some of my listeners will, like some people will only listen on one. Like there's like, like I, there's some podcast I used to listen to that went exclusive to like one thing, but only on Spotify. I don't listen to them anymore because I, yeah. I personally don't like listening to podcasts on Spotify <laughs> myself. Yeah. I have other podcast apps I enjoy, and if I can't get the show on there, I'm unfortunately not going to listen to it, even though it was one of my favorite shows. So I it's like I think there's two podcasts now that I just don't listen to anymore because they went exclusive. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure you know, it's it's all about the money. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> that's why they're hey, doing it. We're 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 all we're all trying to make a buck here somewhere along the way. Oh yeah, but I, I would hope that if that offer came to me, that I wouldn't do it, even for the money. I mean, I I just I've never been a fan of exclusivity and stuff like that. So Spotify comes to you and they say, you know, we're going to give you we're going to give you the the next Joe Rogan deal. <laughs> you know, sixty, hundred million over ten years. Whoever you know, depending on who you believe. But it's got to be on our our platform exclusively. You're saying no to that? I'll, I'll go on record right now. I'm not saying no to that. I, I honestly hope I could. I really hope I could. I mean, it's. I mean, yeah, I'd like to make some money with this, but I, I didn't start the show to get rich. And I would I would hope if they're that interested, then other people would be too. <laughs> so I, I that's would, a great point. Yeah, I would I would I would hope I could say no. I really would. Uh, who knows? I mean, when someone's dangling that in front of you, <laughs> who knows what you're actually going to do? Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, I've, I've just never been a fan of ex- exclusivity for stuff like that. So that's kind of it. Kind of goes back to you know my instructor saying you can only train with me. <laughs> you can't train mm. anywhere else. So maybe that maybe that's part of it. You know, it's, it's Spotify's like John Crease or something. <laughs> <laughs> Spotify is the John Crease of podcast platforms. There we go. You. Heard it here, folks. Let's put that on a t-shirt. Spotify. <laughs> the views of our guests do not necessarily represent the views of Whistlekick and staff. <laughs> there you go. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, everyday martial artists, everyday martial artist.com, right? Yes, correct. Okay. So I folks, I, I hope you do check out Brian's show because he's doing some great stuff. And and you know, if you like the show, there's a really good chance that you like that show as well. And if anyone wants different to suggest guests, a different guest, interviewer, I, I'm open to suggestions. If people want to suggest yeah. certain guests, you can email me at everyday martial artist at gmail.com and just yeah. send me an email and say, Hey, you should have this person, or hey, you know, my instructor has this really good. Cool, I'm looking for people with good stories, different backgrounds. You know, as many different styles as I can. It, it doesn't all have to be celebrities. Like I said, I've had a handful of those recently, but it's a, it's a nice mixture. So, you know, just people with good stories to tell that like like talking and telling their story and, and talking about martial arts and you know, martial arts movies and whatever else we talk about. So, <laughs> nice. Well, time to wrap up shop here. So we'll 
final words, okay. you know, your, your last bits to the folks listening. What do you want to tell them? I would just say it's, I, I said it earlier, I think everyone should give it a try. If you're sitting here and you're thinking, you know, man, my kids do it, but I'm too old, whatever. My mom joined in her forties and got her black belt. And the whole reason she did it is because she came to a demonstration we were doing at a local fair. And one of our students was 83 years old and testing for her red belt. And my mom saw her and she's like, I'm signing up tomorrow. <laughs> so it's, it's don't let age scare you. You know, there's, there's some, uh, some, I think there's a martial arts school out there for everyone. Yes, you can do virtual stuff, but I, you know, I, I don't, I personally don't think you can do virtual unless you had a background in it initially. It's hard to learn from scratch though, because you have to have someone giving you feedback and telling you what you're doing right, right. But I just think try it, even if it's just for a month. You know, most schools will give a free two weeks. You know, if they don't, maybe not again. So someone's not willing to let you try it for free without walking into something. Um, maybe walk away from that one for the most part. But I mean, most schools are willing to give some kind of intro lesson or beginner thing. Just give it a shot and try it. It's try as many as you can. And I honestly, most people who try it like something about it, whether you're going for physical fitness, whether you're going for self-defense, whether you want to get into competition, maybe you want to you know learn to break boards or bricks or something like that. But it's, it, it, learn weapons that's another good part of it but i just think everyone should try it and i like i said hopefully it's something i'll be doing the rest of my life maybe you know maybe not the same style but i, I want to be involved in it for as long as i possibly can there are times when i talk to other martial arts podcasters where i feel like i'm talking to myself in a sense if you think about it the very personality qualities the attributes that make us who we are Someone to get involved in martial arts, well, you know, we already have a lot in common. We talk about that on the show a lot. For someone to start a podcast, that means they have something in common with other people having podcasts. Well, what about martial arts podcasters? There aren't that many of us, and I found that most of them are really amazing people, and I appreciate their friendship and their support and love when we get to collaborate. This episode, not an exception. So, Brian, thank you. Look forward to building a friendship, getting to know more about you and collaborating in, in other ways down the line. Thanks for your time. Listeners, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the show notes for this episode. Check out Brian's website, everydaymartialartist.com. Follow our social media at Whistlekick. If you want to support us in the work that we're doing, remember there's tons of stuff you can do like Buy a book on Amazon, tell somebody else about what's going on, or of course, the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. Don't forget, we've got training programs. The Whistlekick Force program is an equipment-free, at-home, incredibly effective strength and power development program that is going to integrate amazingly well with your martial arts training. If you want to learn more about that and the fact that it's way less expensive than you would probably think it is, go to whistlekickprograms.com. You can read more about it. Grab the Flex program while you're over there. It's completely free. If there's something that you want other than that, well, you're going to have to go to whistlekick.com for that. But don't forget, there's a code, PODCAST15. If you've got feedback for, you know, topics, guests, did we get something right? Did we get something wrong? I want to know. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's it. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.